Tonight, we're going to deal with uh, the uh, second part, or actually the third uh, fruit of the Spirit, and that is uh, the fruit of peace, and how important uh, the word peace is in our life. This past Monday, Brother Mike and I had the privilege of going over to uh, Brother Don Howard's and visit with him. And, of course, Doris was there, and uh, we, we visited. And if you've ever been over at Brother Don's house, you'll note that there are several puzzles that he and Doris have put together uh, over the last... Brother Mike, how many would you say? There's probably 40 or 50 of them in there all together. Uh, just a, a hobby of theirs. But they took us back to the room, uh, the puzzle room, they call it, and they showed us one that they had laid out that they had worked on, but it was missing one piece. And they have looked and they have looked and they have looked for that one piece and cannot find it. They even went back to the store to find the same puzzle, uh, put it together again to see if they can find that missing piece. And I was thinking about that, Mike, as we, uh, we left there, as I was thinking about this sermon tonight, how that kind of goes along with what I really want to say and what I really want to convey to you tonight is how many people live their entire life their life is put together piece by piece, but yet they're missing that one final piece. And I know that uh, a puzzle piece is spelled P-I-E-C-E, and the piece I'm talking about is P-E-A-C-E, but listen, there's a lot of people that are missing the peace of God. I want to tell you something. I, I have thought about this uh, the last couple of days. I do not believe that there's anything better or there's not a better feeling, if I can convey this to you, than when you lay your head down to sleep, than to know that you have peace with God. Really, I want you to think about that for a moment. Is there anything better than that? You know, you can go through life, you can go through a day, and you can have the most horrible day in the world, but yet you can lay your head down in, at night and go to sleep knowing that you have peace with God. We're going to hear, we're going to see a word called reconciliation here in just a moment. And that is really what that word really means is that you, God wants everything brought back together to be reconciled to Him. And God wants each and every human being that, that has ever been on this planet to have been reconciled to Him. We'll see that in, in just a moment. But I want you to note that uh, here in Galatians 5.22 it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to dive deep into that verse, uh, those verses tonight. Uh, next week, Lord willing, um, I am going to be having my second vein ablation next Tuesday, but uh, if it goes like it did last week, I will not be able to be here next Wednesday. But if I am, uh, I'll be speaking on what society needs, and they need kindness. And, uh, but I'll pick it up two weeks from now if, if necessary. But let me remind you of this. Christianity is love in action. Amen? It's love in action. Really, love is a catalyst to all of life. And we found there in 1 John chapter 4 that it describes in detail uh, form uh, what love is. And simply, the simplest definition of love is God is love. He's the epitome. He is the characteristic of love. And so Christianity is love in action. If you want to think about joy, joy is the gratefulness of that love. And you think about peace, peace is the confidence of that love. And so if, when someone finds the love of God and someone uh, has salvation and has Jesus Christ, uh, the Holy Spirit put with, placed within them, they're going to know what peace is. Now we can't explain it all, as that verse says, uh, that uh, uh, peace that, we just can't understand. And you've all been there. I've been there uh, where uh, God just showers down His grace and His peace and His mercy upon us. And it's a lot of times we don't understand it. And it's hard to explain sometimes. But there was a question that was asked to a group of people. And the question was this, if you could change what you would want most in life, what would you ask for? And the overwhelming answer was peace. That tells me that there's a lot of people that, that live in turmoil. There's a lot of people that have a lot of trouble. There's a lot, of, a lot of things going on in people's life. And so that was the answer to that important question. What would you ask for? 
an answered peace. Now I want you to know the world's going to offer, and the world tries to offer a peace that will not do anything for anyone. I call them escapisms. Uh, you know, they'll, they say uh, drugs, uh, alcohol, immoral relationships, having to be constantly uh, entertained, just different things that they, they think will conjure up peace within their life. But really it's, it's not the kind of peace that I want to convey uh, to you tonight. But the kind of peace that God can offer is this. And if you want to write something down, the Lord just blessed me with this thought. If you want to write this down, uh, I think it would behoove you to do that. And we do have outlines there if you did not get one. But here's the, the kind of peace that God offers. Are you ready? To be in harmony with God. But it's more than that. To be joined and woven together with God. Hey, it even gets better than that. To be assured of and secure in the love and care of God. Now I'm going to rapidly go through that again. To be in harmony with God, to be joined and woven together with God, and to be assured of and secure in the love and care of God. Now you'll notice on the board that there are four things that we're going to look at tonight very quickly. The person of peace, the power of peace, the presence of peace, and the plan of peace. I invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. We find that 700 years before the first coming of Christ, we actually hear the name called, and it says this, and I want you to turn there, Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah 9, verse 6. Usually you hear this during the Christmas season, but I think it's important. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name, here we go, will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, I conveyed a few thoughts to our men's uh, Bible study, our men's prayer group a few months ago, and I want to reiterate this. I don't know if you guys will remember this or not, but I'm going to uh, convey it uh, to, to our body tonight. I believe that this particular name, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, affects every area of our lives. For instance, in the decisions of your life, and boy, there's a lot of decisions in life, is there not? Well, the Bible says that he is our wonderful counselor. In other words, I have someone to talk to. Isn't it nice to know that you can go to God at any moment uh, with the decisions you need to make in life, and he will be there to listen? Matter of fact, he said, come to my throne room and I'll be there for you. I'll be there to help you. Uh, in your time of need. And folks, I'm telling you, that, that excites me, that in the decisions of life, we have a wonderful counselor. But what about the, the, the dilemmas of life? And there's a lot of dilemmas that, that we find ourselves in uh, throughout life. Well, when I think about that, I have somewhere to go. Now think about it. He's not just a wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. We can go to the mighty God, almighty Yahweh God. And not only that, his name affects the area of our life of distractions, the distractions of life. Have you ever been distracted? Never. <laughs> There's lots of distractions out there. But get this, he is the everlasting father. And the Bible teaches us throughout scripture that we are to focus on the heavenly father. In other words, I have someone to focus on. So I have someone to talk to, I have somewhere to go, but I also have someone to focus on. And then the fourth area is the disappointments of life. And oh boy, do we have those. But I have someone to depend on. The Prince of Peace. You see how all, you see how that name affects every area of our life because we're going to be going through those things. But we do have someone to talk to, somewhere to go, someone to go to. We have someone to focus on, and we have someone that we can depend on. 
Folks, that's the person of peace. That's Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Now think about it. Jesus was never in a hurry, and I never have found where Jesus was ever afraid. I do not believe you'll ever find that in Scripture, that He was ever afraid. Even as He was going to die on the cross for the sins of the world, He was not afraid. The shadow of the cross kept getting closer and closer, and I find that the closer the cross, the more He talked about it. That's how important it was. But He never showed the slightest fear. Why? Because nothing ever upset his peace. <laughs> he had peace in his heart. Nothing ever disturbed his poise. Even when he was being beaten, spit upon, and railed upon, and all that, he never opened his mouth, the Word said. He never lost his poise. Why? Because he had peace in his heart. Now Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, turn there if you would. Book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 13 says, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our what? Say it. What is it? He is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of of separation. Now, I'm not going to go into the historical detail of all that and, and the Jewish details of all that, but I do want to reiterate to you, and, and Brother Mike mentioned this Sunday, that when he died, the temple, the veil was torn in two, which meant we could have access, true access and total access with uh, our Heavenly Father. And that verse is kind of t talking about that. But there's another verse that says in Romans 5.1, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. I'm not going to jump ahead of Brother Mike. He's uh, going to be speaking on Romans 5 uh, not too many weeks away. But it says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have, what is it? Peace with God through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. So folks, He's the person of peace. You want peace in your life, you've got to go to Jesus. Okay? Everybody understand that? Let's look at the second thing. Matthew chapter 14. Turn to Matthew chapter 14. Now I'm going to share a couple of very familiar stories with you tonight. But uh, these are compelling stories when it comes to this thing called peace. Matthew chapter 14, look at verse 22. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. So we, we get the picture where Jesus is. He's on the mountain. He's up there praying for his disciples because he knows the dilemma that they're going to be in in a short period of time. So he's up there already uh, interceding on their behalf. And so the boat, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went there to pray. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Really, he was saying, I am. Okay? Okay. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. What's happened here? He took his eyes off Jesus. Did he not? He's in a dilemma. He's in a, he's in a between a rock and a hard place. He's been distracted by the wind and the waves. And because of those distractions, he took his eyes off Jesus, and he began to sink. Now think about it. Peter learned the secret of peace the day that he walked on water. The darkness had come. 
The winds were whipping the waves into mountains, so it seemed to be like mountains. Peter and the rest of the disciples thought they were doomed, thought they were at the end. But then Jesus shows up. Any good to know Jesus, the Prince of Peace, shows up? Well, I thought I'd get more amens out of that. He shows up, folks. I'm so thankful that he shows up in our time of need. He's, he, he wasn't coming to them beside them. He wasn't in another boat coming up beside them. He came walking on top of the storm. Now get that. Everything that you go through in life is already under the feet of Jesus. The Bible tells us that. And so uh, Peter's out there, and he's, he's taken a step or two, and he then takes his eyes off of Jesus, and all of a sudden uh, he sinks, and he, and he cries out in fear. And, and here, here's what happened. The Lord, the Prince of Peace, he reaches down, and he pulls him back up. Whew. Can you imagine that's what he first did when they got back on that boat? I tell you what, back on the boat, there was a sense of peace that had come into his heart. It was because the Prince of Peace was there. The power of Jesus. I think Peter, along with the other disciples, learned that peace was having Jesus in the boat and leaving the storm with him. I'm going to tell you something in life. We need to understand Jesus' presence is with us, and we just need to leave the storm in His hands, right? And um, I think we'll be better off because He's the one that has power. Now, there was another occasion, and I'm not going to have you turn there, but in Matthew chapter 8, we find that there was another time that they were on the boat, and the winds began to blow, and the, the waves were boisterous, and, and it just seemed like there was no way out, and we find Jesus is... <laughs> down at the bottom of the boat asleep. The Prince of Peace was asleep. <laughs> wow. So they, they rile him up, they wake him up, said, do you not even care if we perish? <laughs> and Jesus just simply said, peace be still. Wow. They were marveled at that. The Bible, the Scriptures, they just marveled at that. How even the winds and the waves obey His voice. I'm going to tell you there's something powerful about the Prince of Peace. And people that are missing out on peace, they need His power in their life. Let me tell you the third thing. Well, I don't want to skip something. I'll get to the third thing in just a minute, okay? I got time, okay? John 14, 27 is a, a wonderful verse for Christians. And this is a verse we can convey to our lost friends and family. Peace I leave with you. Jesus said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, but give I unto you. Peace is a gift of God. It's a gift of Jesus. And so, he had already talked to his disciples, and uh, don't be anxious about anything. Don't, don't be concerned about things. You believe God, you believe also in me. I, I'm going to go away, and I'm going to prepare a mansion for you. And if I go away, I'm going to return, and I'm going to take you where I am. And we're going to be there forever. And you remember the verse in uh, 14, verse 6, where he said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. That is such a key verse when we're witnessing and we're telling people about Jesus. Because he is the only way. But I believe the actual legacy of Christ is not just to give salvation, but it's to give peace to us as we journey through life. <laughs> this Prince of Peace, he could sleep in the bottom of a boat, he could face demon-possessed madmen. He could hold his peace when his enemies were baiting him and they were badgering him. He could hold his peace when he was falsely accused, when he was mocked, and when he was railed upon. You see, the peace of God protected his heart against all odds. And I want to tell you, the peace of God will protect our hearts. That's how powerful God's peace is. And here's three reasons why. You ready? Number one, he is omniscient. Think about it. He knows all things, including how it's going to end. He's not only omniscient, he's omnipotent. 
That means he is all-powerful. He is the Almighty God. He was able to create a hundred billion galaxies with a single word. Think about that. <laughs> Nothing can defeat his purpose. But he's also omnipresent. He's everywhere. Now the devil can't do that. But Jesus can. Have you ever stopped to think nothing can happen behind his back? Think about that. If he's everywhere, nothing can happen behind his back. So he knows everything, all the details that's going on in your life. That's the kind of Prince of Peace we have. And the power that he gives. Now we can go to the presence of peace. Another uh, interesting story that we find in God's Word. I, I love this, and uh, I have preached on this many times, and Pastor Mike has as well, but it's found in Acts chapter 12. I'm going to read a few of these verses to you. Acts chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, uh, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also, now it was during the days of unleavened bread. Now that's key. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but, now church, you need to hear this, constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, underline that word sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the doors, before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by, and a light shone in the prison. He struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. In other words, get dressed, get your shoes on. Okay? And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and he followed him and did not know what was done by the angel, uh, what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past, when they were past the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Now what was Peter doing? He's in a dilemma of life. He's in a, 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 a perilous time in his life. He is in prison. Is he sitting there biting his fingernails, Brother Mike? No. Is he pacing up and down the cell? No. <laughs> Folks, you know what he's doing? He's sleeping. And I want to tell you, he can only sleep if he had peace in his heart. And I want to tell you, that's what God does for us in our dilemmas of life. Peace is one of the fruits of the Spirit, and it's ministered to, minister to us as we rest, as we rest, as we rest in the arms of Jesus. You see, when he went to sleep that night, I mean, all you got to do is think about being in the arms of Jesus, folks. That's how peaceful it really is. Now, do you remember what I said uh, uh, at the outset of this, uh, this lesson? To be in harmony with God, to be secure in love and care of God. Makes sense, doesn't it? Let me share, share this verse with you. Psalm 29, verse 11. I love this verse. Psalm 29, verse 11 says this, The Lord will give strength to His people. The Lord will bless His people with, what is it? Peace. Isn't God good? Now, when you think about it, you think about Paul and Silas there in uh, prison in, in Acts chapter 16. Now, what are they doing? They're singing. And they're praying. And is it midnight? How could they do that? I'll tell you how they could do that is because the Lord will bless his people with peace. How can you sing and how can you pray during turbulent times in your life 
the Lord will bless his people with peace. That's the presence of peace. He will never leave you or forsake you. We know that. We understand that. Well, let me f- wrap this up. Got about four minutes. The plan of peace. And guess what? You are a big part of the plan. If you're a child of God, you are part of the plan. (laughs) You are to exhibit the peace of God throughout your journey of life. I've already told you about the person of peace and the power of peace and the presence of peace. You're to display that throughout your life. And here's how we do it. Colossians chapter 1. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Look with me in verse... I'm going to begin in verse 19, Zach. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross... And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Now, I want you to understand that the word reconcile means to be brought back together. What is God's plan? What, what, is God, what does God want? He wants all of his, all of the people that he's created, he wants them to be brought back together with him. Now we know Adam and Eve plunged the human race into sin. We can go through the the entire word of God and we can see where God shows up and we could see where God had a ram in the thicket for Abraham when he was to sacrifice Isaac. We see where uh, he had Noah build an ark. God has always been about bringing people together and bringing people back to him. But it's a choice that people must make. God is not going uh, to make a puppet out of anyone. We know that. Now, my last scripture, or last couple of scriptures, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And let me wrap this up. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 18. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, now this is a key verse, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent God, right? We represent heaven, the country of God. As as though God were pleading through us, We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Folks, that's our ministry. It's to share not only the person of peace and the power of peace and and the presence of peace, but we're to introduce them to the Prince of Peace. That's our job. Last verse in Colossians 3.15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Be thankful. There was a song written, songwriter wrote this, he said, Peace, perfect peace. In this dark world of sin, the blood of Jesus whispers peace within. Peace, perfect peace. With sorrows surging around on Jesus' bosom, not but calm is found. Peace, perfect peace with loved ones far away. In Jesus' keeping, we are safe and they. Peace, perfect peace, our future all unknown. Jesus we know and he is on the throne. Peace, perfect peace, death shadowing us and ours. Jesus has vanquished death and all its powers. It is enough, earth struggles soon shall cease. And Jesus' call to heaven's perfect peace.